Side Hustle Show 171, how to get paid to create content, even when you're just starting out. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your nine to five may make you a living, but your five to nine makes you alive. And now your host, Nick Loper. What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show. This is episode 171, and it's the one I wish I'd heard 171 episodes ago. We're talking about how to get paid to create content, how to get sponsorships for your blog, your podcast, your anything, even if you're starting from scratch. I'm joined by the go-to guy when it comes to landing sponsorship deals, Jason Zook. You may know him as Jason Surfer App, JasonHeadsets.com, or most famously as the I Wear Your Shirt guy. He's booked over $1.5 million worth of sponsorship deals from more than 2,000 different companies. And he's even got a free seven-day mini course on this subject over at GetSponsorships.co, GetSponsorships.co. But in the meantime, we're going to dive into how to identify potential sponsors for your content, how to craft a winning value proposition and pitch email, and Jason's so true it hurts take on the inevitable question about selling out. Notes and links for this one are at sidehustlenation.com slash sponsors. And of course, while you're there, you can grab free PDF highlight reel with all of Jason's top tips from this conversation. Now, speaking of sponsors, I'd like to thank freshbooks.com for sponsoring this edition of the Side Hustle Show. FreshBooks is the small business accounting software built specifically for side hustlers and freelancers. I'm gonna be back and tell you a little bit more about FreshBooks, plus my top takeaways from this conversation after the interview with Jason, but you can get started today with your free 30-day trial at freshbooks.com slash side hustle. All right, let's get Jason on the line. It's just, it's a great way to make money, but the big asterisk there is that it takes work. And if you're not in for doing a little bit of work, if you're not in for putting in effort, I don't, number one, I don't know why you're listening to this show because, right, like side hustle, you have to be willing to put in some extra work, some extra time, some extra effort. And you'll get some results. Anything you do will lead to something. Any, any effort that you put in will lead to some result. It may not be the result you want. It may not be the millions of dollars that you are hoping for. But you will learn something. And I think that's so important these days, especially as just access to information and ability to sell things. And just to do anything online in a matter of minutes, we expect immediate gratification. And sometimes what we miss out on is that gratification can be other things than just dollars. So I just wanted to frame that because... I start talking about sponsorships and people immediately go, okay, cool. I can do this tomorrow. I can send the emails. Yes, you can. But that doesn't mean that you're going to land sales just like you're not going to pop up a website and make $10,000 tomorrow. Right. There's a, uh, there's a ramp up period and there's, and there's got to be a compelling reason for somebody to invest in you. And that's kind of one thing I'm curious about. Like when you started the I Wear Your Shirt stuff, did you have any sort of audience or was it just like this is an experiment and we're going to see what happens? I started with nothing. <laughs> I started with no presence on the internet. I started with no knowledge of even how I was supposed to use Twitter or like I called tweets twats. Like I just, I literally did not know what they're called. And I say that as a joke, but that was true in 2008. I did not know what these things were. And it's just one of those things where I, I wanted it more than I was afraid of the work that it was going to take. And so I knew that it was an uphill battle. At the time, I'm a nobody. I still feel like a nobody, but I'm a nobody from Florida who lives in a beach town who doesn't really love being on the internet or using technology that much. And yet now I'm saying, hey, I want to every single day record a video, tweet, Facebook, do all these things to promote a brand. And that was I Wear Your Shirt. And I didn't know what I was doing. I had no experience. I'd never done sales before. I mean, I could be the best case study ever on why anyone in the world could get sponsorships because I had everything working against me. And yet let's go back to my social proof over 2000 sponsors, over 1.5 million generated. It can be done. And, and so what I just started realizing very early on, Nick was I just have to figure out a way to make this compelling. I have to figure out a way to make it interesting. And now some of that came from pricing. So we talked about this a little bit before we got on air, but I wear your shirt started with this increasing pricing model where you would buy the first day was a dollar, the second day was two dollars, the third day was three dollars. And it went all the way up to the end of the year at 365 bucks. And that added up. All 365 days combined equaled $66,795. Now, if you would have thought about it in the beginning, you would have said like, oh, but you're only going to make a dollar on the first day, two dollars on the second. But that was a compelling reason for sponsors to get on board because it cost them little to nothing. 
And then when they realized, well, this was obviously well worth more than $2 or $13 or $50 or even $365 because I built a plan to under-promise and over-deliver at every chance that I could through my sponsorship stuff. So one of the first things that I would tell people as we dig into how to get sponsorships for anything that you're listening to this you want to get sponsorships for is that you have to build a plan from the beginning. And that starts with one really important thing, which is your value proposition, which is like, what is the thing that you're selling? But you even need to jump a little bit further down the road of, well, what am I offering though? Like, what is a sponsor going to get? And how can I convince them that I have a unique angle on this? Because, you know, listen, let's just be honest here, Nick. How many people are trying to get sponsors for their podcast these days? Let's just pick podcasts. There is probably a thousand new shows that launch every week. So if you think that you're a new show that's not doing any crazy new format, that's not doing any – I mean nothing is really that different about you except for you as a person, which I appreciate. People are different. Why would a sponsor say yes to you? You have to come up with a compelling angle. You have to come up with an interesting different reason because when we're getting started like I was a couple years ago – I had no audience that I could pitch. I couldn't say thousands of people are showing up every day. I have all these listens. I have accolades from iTunes. We don't have those things. I still don't have those things for my podcast. But I'm able to get paying sponsors because I send them interesting pitches. And we can dive into that too if you want. But Yeah, what would be an example of, hey, I want to start start a podcast and right out of the gate try and monetize? What I did with my podcast, and now I do have to give a little bit of, again, like another caveat because I have an audience now. So it's a little bit different for me, but I didn't have any listeners. When I first got started, I mean, my podcast was brand new. Episodes hadn't even gone live, and I was pitching sponsors before that even went live. And I told them, I said, here's what I think will happen. I think I will get somewhere between 500 and 1,000 downloads per episode after the first month. That's what I think will happen. These podcast episodes are not going to disappear. They're going to be there forever. So it's, you know, it has some longer value to it. And I'm going to show up weekly. So I'm going to be consistent. I'm planning on doing this for at least a year. So every week I'm going to publish a new episode. You can plan on knowing that I'm going to continue to keep bringing my podcast up into the ears of my listeners. Uh, And so what I did with the, the actual pitch of the sponsorship to these sponsors, my creative angle on it was I am only going to talk about sponsors that I use. Now, that doesn't sound super creative and compelling, but imagine it from the sponsor's side. When they get an email from someone, and and I was very clear. I said, I am not going to talk about Casper mattresses. I'm not going to talk about MailChimp because I don't even really use MailChimp anymore. I'm not going to talk about any of the normal companies you hear because I do not use them. Even though they pay money, I want it to be like when you listen, you go, yeah, that's Jason does wear those dress shirts from Mizzen and Maine. Like that's the only company that he wears dress shirts from. And it's true. I can show you a picture in my closet. They're the only ones I own. And so I just started reaching out to these companies and just telling them my story and saying, I believe I can get these numbers. And if that's what matters to you, great. But I also believe that there's a compelling story that I'm going to tell through these sponsorships and that I use these companies. And so that was my angle. And now that angle may not work for other people, but I think that there's an angle that everyone can come up through just through a little creative thinking, brainstorming, you know, trial and error. Did you end up going with, hey, let's do a fixed price deal? Or was it like, hey, let's try something on a performance basis? I do not like performance basis stuff. I just think that it's, number one, podcasting is so difficult of a platform to get people to take action. And that's my big thing. I want to help people take action. And I know that it's very difficult to turn someone driving in their car, listening to me ramble about something on a podcast, into an email for someone's company or into a paying subscriber. Because here's what people don't do. They don't drive down the road, listen to a podcast, hear an ad and go, oh, just pull their car over to the side of the road and immediately grab their phone and start looking up that website. That does not happen. And I think a lot of sponsors know this. They realize this podcasting has been around long enough and people have been sponsoring it long enough. So what you have to come to is an agreement with that sponsor on them understanding being a part of that show is brand awareness which is a hard thing to sell, but it is a sellable thing. And they want to work with you. They believe in you as a person and what you stand for. And then you have to offer other things. So I talked about like just a couple minutes ago about under-promising and over-delivering. And you asked about price. I'm going to get to that too. When I was sending these pitches, this is exactly what I did. So I created a value proposition, like what my podcast was about, the uniqueness of like what I was going to talk about, my schedule, uh, that I'm only looking for sponsors that I use. And then I said, here's what I want to do. I want $1,000 per episode for a podcast sponsor, and here's what that includes. Pre-roll, 
post roll and it's me doing actual reads like not like pre-written pre-scripted stuff i'm just a real person so it sounds real i'm going to include you in a link in my email list and i have about 10,000 subscribers on my email list it's at the bottom so it's not like you're the featured thing but you're included and i may shout you out on social media but that's not guaranteed and then you just get you know your podcast is there forever and so i sent this out and every sponsor that i sent this to and i sent it to about 10 companies that i knew and had emails to and they all fired back with it's too expensive you're a new show we can't you know we don't know how to do that they all said we'll do it for 500 bucks an episode okay this is a part of the planning of pitching sponsors for a brand new show. Right. Yeah, but you also, you don't go in with your bottom line price. I probably would have expected, hopefully none of my sponsors are listening, I probably would have taken like 100 bucks per episode. Just because it was a brand new show, if you get sponsors on, then it at least shows other sponsors, oh, other people pay for this, I could pay for this too, and then I could raise my prices. But I went high because I wanted them to talk me down. I knew that that was going to happen. One company didn't talk me down. One company basically just said, okay, if you believe it's worth this, we believe in you. We like your pitch. We like the idea of the show. They knew me for a couple of years. We're in. So I've just started playing around with some uh, some official sponsorship deals for the Side Hustle show. And cool. you've given me some ammunition to, uh, to play with here. Yeah, I think one of the beautiful things is that you can learn from every part of the sponsorship process. You know, And, and I've learned so much about the courage of asking through all the years of the crazy things that I've asked for. And I'm just not afraid to send an email to a company and say, this is what I believe I am worth. And if they want to write back and say, number one, we don't think you're worth that, that's fine. That's their opinion. But if they also want to tell me, hey, our budgets can't match what you think you're worth, but this is compelling. This is interesting. Can we work on this? That's a great in. Like all I want is my foot in the door when I'm emailing people and then I'm happy to haggle and, and work with it because – these sponsors didn't exist for me before, and now that they do and they're on my radar, I want to land them and make a, a good relationship happen. Now, are you just going to the Mizzen and Main homepage, for example, and scrolling to find their contact page and like sending a generic note through there? Or are you doing any other sleuthing to find the decision maker? So for my specific example for my podcast, I already had the emails of all of these companies. So I had known someone, I had worked with someone there. However, there are a lot of well, not a lot, but there are a couple of really interesting ways that you can find a company's email. Um, one is actually a recent one that I found. It's emailhunter.co. And it doesn't work with every website, but you can put in a company's URL and it will pop out if they have ever posted their email pretty much anywhere online. And so Mizzen and Main is a perfect example. I'm looking at the site right now. It gives me five email addresses from their company. This is a free service. Anyone can go and use it right now. Hopefully by the time this airs, it hasn't like disappeared. <laughs> and you can find these emails. Now, for some companies, it doesn't work. For some companies, you're not going to find the answer. So that's one tip. The other thing that you can do is you can actually just Google a company's URL, like actually Google their URL, and then Google like email address or at their URL. And sometimes you'll find press releases or you'll find statements that they've put out and it has someone's email. And so you can find their email that way. And now the third way that I find emails, and this is actually how I find a lot of emails, is I reach out to my connections on social media. So like I'll post something on Facebook or I'll post something on Twitter or I'll just email my list when I'm in this mode of trying to find things. And I'll just say, does anybody know anybody at these companies? Now, very rarely are you going to be able to put like Coca-Cola and Target and like really big brands that people are going to know somebody. But you may put smaller brands and you'd be shocked to find out that someone knows someone who knows someone. So those are three ways that I find emails. And I have to be honest, I've never tried to find an email for a company and not been able to find something. It just takes, again, effort in like looking around and Googling and, and looking into emails and asking people. Yeah. And even if it's not the perfect person, hey, maybe you can point me in the right direction. Oh, here's another one. I don't recommend this all the time because sometimes it makes me feel a little bit sleazy, but sometimes you just got to get that email. Is I'll email the support email at a company and I'll say, hey, I'm trying to get a hold of someone in marketing and I couldn't find the right email. Can you point me in the direction of someone just so I can send something along to them? I've done this probably, I don't know, 20 times in my life of getting sponsorships. Every time it has worked. That doesn't seem that sleazy. For me, it's like if I'm asking for the email, I don't know, it feels weird. But it works and you know why? Because that support person's job is one thing, Nick. To give support. Close out your ticket. <laughs> yeah, here's Matt's email. Boom. Can you give me a smiley face? Because that's how I get paid for my job. <laughs> and it works. And you get you get emails from people and then you can reach out. It's not guaranteed that you're going to actually hear back or anything, but it does get your foot kind of in the door of getting that email. How about on the blog front? Or if I'm trying to build a niche site or an authority site and I kind of am looking at 
sponsorships as an alternative to you know affiliate monetization or even AdSense monetization. I heard uh, John Chow speak at a, at a conference you know years and years ago. And he's like, hey, I got rid of all of the third party advertising in my sidebar because if it's Google, if it's AdRoll, if it's any of these other companies. They're taking half the money. I'll just reach yeah. out and sell the stuff directly to the advertisers. Is it yeah. similar for, for this type of deal? So I've actually never had a site where I've had like Google AdSense or anything. Uh, I've used some Amazon affiliate stuff. Uh, you just don't typically make enough money if you're not generating enough traffic for those things. I do think they're a great place to start. It's a zero barrier to entry. You can put it on there. You can see how it goes. Putting that on there sometimes does help a sponsor see, oh, okay, like this is where my ad would go. This is how it would look with their content. Yeah. But if I was trying to get sponsors for a blog, and I, I've actually never had sponsors for a blog. I've helped people get them because I Wear Your Shirt essentially was a sponsored blog but through a very different avenue. Mm -hmm. But that's how I would do it, right? So I would try and find the unique angle that I would see, okay, if I'm reaching out to – let's just throw names out there that everybody knows so it's very easy to comprehend – I am a mattress blog. I review mattresses because I want to share with the world that most mattresses suck and I have like the perfect body for laying on a mattress, right? So <laughs> I, this is just the weird thing that I'm starting. I would reach out to a company like Casper or any of these, these companies and I would say, hey, I want to do a full write-up and review on your mattress. But I want to go in depth. Like I want to sleep on this thing for three months. I want to catalog it. I want to take photos, data, blah, blah, blah. And then I would hit them with a pitch for that and say, this is going to cost you $5,000 or whatever. Getting started, they may come back to you and just go, no, no, we're not going to pay any money. We'll give you a free mattress and that could start a relationship with us and then we can move forward if that does well. And that's a great starting point because then you could get something that you have fodder for content. You write this huge epic blog post. It does really well. Maybe a lot of people share it. They find it funny. They find it interesting. And then Casper comes back and goes, okay, we want more of this, right? Like we saw something work with this. Again, your foot is now in the door. I think it's just about coming up with different angles because so many people tend to think, I'm going to start a blog, I'm going to carve out some real estate on my blog, and I'm going to put companies in there. And again, this just goes back to the question about how many podcasts are out there. That's not unique. That doesn't make any sponsor feel like they're going to be getting anything of value that someone else couldn't get from any other website. So I really think it just comes down to – and you don't have to be insanely creative to come up with these ideas. It just takes sitting down and thinking and maybe having a friend sit with you and go, what could we do on my mattress blog? Like what are some interesting ideas we could come up with? And then pass those ideas on to a sponsor and let them dictate the, oh, this is interesting. I could see this really working. And another way to do this stuff for blog posts, especially for blogs that are just getting started, is create sponsor-less content but – Figure out how you could fit a sponsor into it once it's successful. So what I mean by that is write the really epic piece of content using a Casper mattress or doing whatever. Let it become successful. Then bring it to that company and go, look at this thing. Look at what it's doing. It's getting 1,000 unique visits a day or a week or a month. Uh, would you like to be a part of it? You know, do you want to put you know, something about you guys on here sponsoring this for 500 bucks a week or a month or something? That also becomes a great point of leverage for getting sponsors. Okay, these are the 15 hotels with the most comfortable beds in the world, uh, sponsored by whoever. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think you go like one circle outside of what you're doing to find more people. Like, what are the best nightstands to go next to a mattress? What is the best bedding to go on a mattress? What are the best pillows? Uh, what's the best lighting for a bedroom? Like, there's so many companies that become related to the one thing you're talking about that people don't go that one circle outside of. And I think that's where a lot of people think like, oh, but my blog is so niche. Like, I only talk about down comforters for beds. It's like, yeah, but what you don't understand is that people who read stuff about down comforters and they want to know which one's the best, they also love pillows and they also love mattresses and they love nightstands and they love all this other stuff that gets just related to that. Yeah, so I'm hearing more of a content-driven approach on the blog front rather than, oh, I want to sell a banner ad space. I think so. That's what I've done. I firmly believe that you can sell ad space. Lots of people do sell ad space and it works. I just think you need more traffic than I personally have ever had for a website that I could give you anecdotal data on. Any tips on figuring out what companies to target, like in the in the mattress realm? I guess that's uh, an easy one. Let's say like I have, um, you know, if it's not a product type blog or if it's more of like a lifestyle type site, I don't know if that's too broad. Grab a piece of paper, put down your main focus of what you write about. You know, let's call it a travel blog, right? So I've got this travel blog and I, I just write about traveling. And so the, the main circle is travel. 
And then you just draw a bunch of circles around that of different things that go along with travel. You know, airplanes, food that you travel with, hotels, you know, different technology that you take while traveling, uh, credit card companies, like all these different things. And then you figure out, okay, which ones kind of go into that circle of travel that I really want to talk about? Because you don't just want to take money from any sponsor. I mean, that devalues your content. It devalues your audience. It, it devalues you as a person that takes integrity away. But you can really find like, oh, you know what? Like I want to work with JetBlue. Like they're the only airline that I love to fly and I have a great story about them that I've written about on my travel blog. I could reach out to them. Okay. And now that's a that's a big brand. It may be hard to get your foot in the door with that brand. But I think with the right content, with the right compelling story, there's a foot in the door for everybody who is willing to just kind of reach out and, and explain why they have a great value for that thing. So again, I think that there's – whether your niche as crazy, weird, small thing, there's always things outside of your crazy, weird, small thing that your audience would enjoy and that there are companies available there who have money who will sponsor you. Uh, you bring up a good point and that's kind of the internal fear. <laughs> maybe it's yeah. uh, maybe it's made up or maybe it's not of looking like a sellout. Like, oh, if I start accepting a sponsored content, if I start accepting sponsors on my podcast, like, oh, I'm going to look like a sellout. So I've been called a sellout. Well, actually not recently, which is kind of nice. But in the early days of Irie Shirt, I was called a sellout a lot. And, you know, I, I really thought about it pretty deeply for a while. And what I came to the conclusion on selling out is this is if you're accepting money for something you don't want to be doing, that's a sellout. Now, for me, that's a lot of people who have nine to five jobs that they hate. And I'm sorry, but you taking a paycheck every day for something you don't enjoy doing, life is too short for that. You know, you're going to work a third or more of your life and you're barely going to be able to enjoy any of that time because you hate your job. I, on the other hand, have sold my shirt. I've sold my last name. I've sold my future. I've sold all this weird, crazy stuff. But everything I've done, I've really enjoyed it. It has been fun. It's been a journey for me, and I've done it the exact way that I want. And so I think if anybody is feeling like, oh, if sending a sponsor pitch makes me feel like a sellout, reframe it in a way of, am I proud of this project? Am I proud of the thing that I'm doing? Do I want to get paid to continue to do this thing? Well, then I shouldn't feel like a sellout at all. If anything, I should be more proud and I should have a lot more pride when I'm sending these emails and not feel sleazy. Man, that cuts pretty deep. I like it. <laughs> I think that's part of the like the main issue of this this just whole image of feeling like a sellout or feeling like you're you know you're a sleazy salesman because I, I've been there and I've written about this in many times and I've experienced this in many different ways in my life and I do think it does have to get to the deeper core of it. You know, selling is just a part of the process of building anything online and side hustles are so important that they show you I think some things that you're normal job or hustle or, or whatever thing is you're working on, don't show you. I think that's a beautiful part of, of having a side hustle. So if you can also learn some of these like deeper life things of, man, why do I feel like a sellout when I'm saying, you know, I should not feel that way. I want to do this full time. This could be really cool to have these companies that support my blog or my podcast or, you know, if I'm an event or whatever, that's actually what I want. That's what I want to be doing full time. A couple more things to kind of dive a little bit deeper on on this stuff. So we've kind of come up with our, our content ideas or, you know, what our thing is we actually want to create. And we've come up with a list of, you know, some companies that we want to target you mentioned a little bit of this, what uh, what a compelling pitch might look like. But curious if there's any other elements that are must include in in that initial pitch email. I think the initial pitch email is actually less important than most people think. The thing that you want the most from the initial pitch email is a response. You want someone to have a conversation with, whether that's continued through email or if you get on the phone. I am allergic to getting on the phone with people doing sales. <laughs> I have sold so many sponsorships and I think – I could probably count on my hands and toes how many of them I had to get on the phone for. No joke. Out of 2,000, it is probably 20 or less. That's pretty impressive. And the reason being is because email is really an easy way to have a conversation with people. It's a really easy way because a lot of people, you know, myself included, we sit in our inbox all day long. But when you're sending out these sponsorship pitch emails, you just want a response from the first one. Now, you don't just want to send an email that just says, hey, what's up? And then they just, they're like, well, what is up? Now I have to write back to this guy and find out. And then when they find out you're pitching a sponsorship, they're like, oh, screw this guy. But if you send an email that, that kind of teases them a little bit, that gives them an idea of, of what your sponsorship is, of what you're working on, but if they're interested and you say like, would you like to know more? Could we further this conversation? Could we keep chatting about it? Is this something you'd be interested in? And getting that reply is pretty much the biggest part of this battle because then you can start the conversation with the sponsor and find out, is the timing right for them? Do they have the budget for your project? Uh, are they interested? Do they even do paid sponsorships? Because a lot of companies don't even do that. 
And so just getting that reply is really important. And I think the big tip for me on figuring out what to email people about is to just understand what they would want and what they would get. Like what benefit does a sponsor get from you getting them as a sponsor? And if you can think about it from their perspective for just a few minutes when you're writing a sponsor pitch email, you can really make them happy when you send them an email because you can say, hey, here's what you're going to get. You're going to get a thousand people who see your logo every week. Uh, You're going to get mentioned in an email newsletter that goes out to 900 people. You're going to get some shout outs on social media. Yeah, I don't have a huge following. I've got like 500 total followers on all my different outlets, but it's going to be creative and fun. And here are even some images I've mocked up. And you show them these tangible benefits that they get, and it just makes it much harder for them to say, I'm not interested, of no matter what size you are as a business reaching out to them. Have you ever had anybody come back and be like, well, that totally wasn't worth it? <laughs> I'll give you an example most recently is, and hopefully they don't mind that I say this, but so I had FreshBooks as a sponsor on my podcast. I've used FreshBooks for years. I mean, I, every sponsor with Our Reader Shirt got a FreshBooks invoice, and there were over 1,600 sponsors. And so I, I loved using them and, you know, they had talked about, we actually did get on a call uh, with that one and they were talking about, oh, you know, we're with podcasts, it's really hard to see if they're converting. You know, we're, we're trying to do some conversion uh, based stuff, but we're willing to pay for just the brand awareness of what you're doing. Uh, but there's a link we want you to use to have people to sign up for a trial and zero people signed up through my trial link. And I can see that over 8,000 downloads of the five episodes they sponsored were there. So that's, you know, it's like 8,000 people or you know, somewhere, I don't know, some number of people in there in the thousands that heard that pitch but didn't go. And they're like, you know, we expected at least a couple, you know, to go through. And why don't we wait a couple months to see if we're going to do anything again? Because they did like me. They did like the ad reads. They thought it was really fun. They thought it was interesting. And we talked about that for the meeting because I said, if you only care about conversions, I don't want to do this deal because I want that to be clear that I can't guarantee conversions. This is a new thing for me. Podcasting is just difficult. Again, swerving off to the side of the road doesn't happen. So knowing that conversation happened up front and knowing what they were going to get, you know, they were a little bit, I think, bummed could be a a word that we use. But they also understood that, hey, we got a bunch of value. You know, we did get a bunch of of traffic to the site. We got a bunch of people who did it. We just didn't get any conversions. Let's hold off on doing anything, you know, for a couple months and see if anything happens. And that happens. That happens to me as someone who has a lot of sponsorship experience who has a pretty good size audience these days. Sometimes these things just don't align. They just don't work out. It's not hitting your audience at the right time. And you just have to learn from that and move forward. And you can't derail all of your progress based on just this one, you know, thing happening that didn't work out perfectly well. FreshBooks is actually sponsoring this episode. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Hopefully they see some some action taking. What is the link? We have to tell people right now and they have to go to the link to sign up. (laughs) It's freshbooks.com slash side hustle. Yeah. Everybody listen to swerve your car to the side (laughs) of the road. You go to that damn link and you sign up for the trial because you know, it is, it's really interesting. I think with podcasting, a lot of people, and I know this from my own list, people will email me and they will say, Oh, I listened to this episode and I loved it. And Oh, that sponsor was really cool. I meant to check them out and they didn't. And that's, it's a really difficult thing on podcasts, I think, to, to deliver that. And anybody listening to this who's thinking, oh, I want to get sponsors for my podcast, great. How can you deliver value that's not just conversion based on a podcast episode? Because it's difficult. Get your wheels turning. I'm currently thinking about this myself when I'm trying to come up with compelling ways using my website, uh, using social media, using my email list that gives people you know, some love to those sponsors and gives them some exposure to them so that they can be hit in kind of multiple different ways because people need to hear things multiple times before they go to freshbooks.com slash side hustle and sign up for that trial. But it can happen. You just have to figure out a way to, again, make that happen. And then so uh, you mentioned, hey, I'm going to throw this out, 1000 bucks an episode. This is all this kind of like a package deal that's included. Do you have any benchmarks for you know picking a number out of the air or is that just it? Like I'm going to guess – I'm going to pick something that I would be 10x happier to accept than than what I might actually take. That is a fantastic way to think about it. What is a number where you would be really happy that would cover all of your expenses if you have expenses for whatever you're doing and that you know at the end of the day that you feel good about and that they can afford? And that if I only got half of it, that's okay too. And that's kind of how I start. It's completely arbitrary. I'm not going to lie. There is no system or specific thing that you can do to like figure out pricing. I know that a lot of the bigger podcasters out there will talk to you about CPM and like coming with a number that's around CPM. But hey, for those of us who are just getting started or who don't have 20,000, 50,000 listens or downloads an episode, it's tough for us. 
And we have to stand up for ourselves and say, no, damn it. We believe in our show and we believe in what we're going to do. And it's the same thing with blogs. It's the same thing with anything else. I believe that my content is good enough to have you stand beside me with it. And let's build a relationship together and see how we can grow together. And you just have to really stand by your word and hope that a sponsor will say, yeah, okay, I'm willing to do that because I see some gusto in you. I see some creativity in you. You are coming at me differently than all the other people who email me every day. And that stuff really stands out to them. I'm glad you say that there's no magic formula because I think that's what everybody's looking for. Like, well, if I just, you know, I'm going to multiply the uh, number of episodes by the number of downloads times, you know, whatever. So that's good to hear. I thought about just making one, like just a really stupid one. It's just like, this is the perfect podcast sponsorship price formula and it just pumps out a number that's completely arbitrary but at least people then feel like oh, okay well cool here's my number you know like i there, there's nothing to it guys you just come up with a number that you feel good about and then a sponsor can afford and you move forward with it and you know i don't know maybe in a year from now if we circled back on this it could be really interesting to see like am i still getting sponsors you know are you still getting sponsors <laughs> how much are we getting are people even sponsoring podcasts anymore it can change so you just have to kind of be willing to stick with it and make the changes and just kind of go with pricing as a completely arbitrary thing almost all the time. Once you get somebody to say yes, now you have a benchmark and you can say, was it worth it for them? Yep. You know, were they getting value from that? You know, plus or minus. And as the, as the audience grows, you can grow from there. So Jason, thanks for taking the time. This is some really interesting stuff, some different angles that I know I haven't thought of, and I'm sure the listeners uh, got some value from it too. So you guys can check Jason out at jasondoesstuff.com. And to learn more about the sponsorship angle, you can go to getsponsorships.co, getsponsorships.co. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. I am going to go with the power of the follow-up email. And I think that my number one tip as it relates to sponsorships, because I think 75% of my sponsorship deals have come from follow-up emails, and that's 2,000 deals. So 75% of those, you have to send follow-up emails. If you are not following up, if you're just sending a pitch email and not hearing back for two weeks and then giving up, you're doing yourself a disservice. Set a follow-up schedule. I like one week after the first pitch email, four days after the second follow-up email, one week after that last email. So that's one week after the first pitch, four days after the first follow-up, and then one week after that second follow-up. And you just stay with it because, again, you want that sponsorship. You're not just, you know, oh, maybe if I get a sponsorship, I can have some money. No, you want it. It's going to help you put bread on your table if that's a thing that people still do. Perfect. The power of the follow-up email, that is uh, a number one tip that actually has uh, never been shared in hundred and. 70 something episodes so that's really cool to hear and and the go. fact that the majority of the deals did not come on that first email so uh, really cool jason thanks so much we'll catch up with you soon all right thanks for having me this edition of the side of the show is brought to you by freshbooks.com when jason started talking about fresh books i was like oh man, I'm going to have to cut all of this. But I think it was actually an important segment to leave in for just for a dose of honesty and transparency. Like while neither of us can guarantee conversions, the important thing is we both agree that we do like their accounting software. And I think you will too. But you don't have to take our word for it. Here's side hustler turned full-time entrepreneur Grayson Bell on why he likes FreshBooks. What's up, Side Hustle Nation? This is Grayson from iMarkInteractive.com. I run a WordPress maintenance and support company that helps bloggers and site owners get started and run on WordPress. I've been using FreshBooks for a little bit over a year now, and it has made my business so much easier to run. I can bring all my expenses in automatically from PayPal, my credit cards, my bank account. I can send recurring invoices to my customers on a regular basis without having to think about it. I've saved thousands with PayPal fees by using their PayPal for business setup. Their support is great. Their interface is easy to use. I've been a fan of, of FreshBooks, and I'll continue to be a fan of FreshBooks. It's streamlined to help my business grow. That's Grayson from iMarkInteractive.com. Visit FreshBooks.com slash SideHustle to start your 30-day free trial today. That's FreshBooks.com slash SideHustle. So my top takeaways from this conversation with Jason, uh, number one, I wanted it more than I was afraid of the work it was going to take. I think that's a really deep uh, quote, and I think that's got to be true for just about any side hustle, even the elusive passive income ones, or, or perhaps especially the elusive passive income ones. How bad do you want it? Number two, aim high to give yourself 
room to negotiate. Number three, a little extra effort can make a real difference to the bottom line, especially on the blog front. He's talking about creating the content first and going after the sponsors second. So I remember like the first display ad I sold on one of my sites and it was it was 50 bucks, but it was selling, selling pixels for dollars was like an incredible feeling. It was completely incremental. I'd already created the site. And I, I think what Jason was trying to say is just like, you have to do great work to attract the people that your sponsors want to reach. But once you've done that, why not give them a call or why not send them an email in his case and see if you guys can, can strike up a deal. And number four, it's only selling out if you're doing something you don't want to do for money really deep stuff. I think this episode was actually packed with a bunch of powerful takeaways. Um, Even just the tidbit that 75% of Jason's deals came from following up. That's huge. So be sure to head over to sidehustlenation.com slash sponsors to grab the free PDF highlight reel with all of Jason's top tips. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Lots of great stuff coming up on the show. But until then, let's go out there, make something happen, and I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 